Stanford University. Okay, well, welcome to Stanford CS193P. This is spring quarter of 2016, and this is lecture number two. And today we are going to talk about MVC. Okay, I'm going to try and really briefly cover that because I know only about half of you know what MVC is, and it's a very important part of doing any iOS development. And then after I'm done with that, I'm going to continue the demo from last time. We'll use MVC and learn yet some more things about Swift uh, and Objective-C. All right? All right, so MVC, what is it? As I mentioned uh, last time, it's essentially a way of dividing up your application, all your source code, uh, into three different camps, okay? The three camps pictured here uh, are the model camp. The model camp is what your application does, okay? Nothing about how it's drawn on screen or anything like that, okay? It's not how it's displayed, it's just what it is. So for a calculator app, what it is, it's a calculator, so the model is probably going to be the part that does calculating, okay? Next piece is the controller. The controller is how your model is displayed on screen, okay? It's kind of the how. This is basically all your UI logic goes into your controller, all right? And the view, you can think of as your controller's minions, okay? The things that the controller is going to use to put things on screen. So that's buttons and labels and tables and all those kind of things that uh, the controller needs to display what's in the model and to get input from the user to update the model as well. Okay, so those are the three camps. Now, it's one thing to decide where things go based on the description of the camp, but a really important piece of it is the communication between camps. What's allowed, what's allowed, what's not, and when communication is allowed, how do you do it, okay, in iOS? How is that communication facilitated? So, to help with this, I've kind of uh, dr drawn here this little Y in the middle. It's kind of like road signs, okay? It's like double yellow at the bottom there is don't cross. And then solid white is, yeah, you can cross, but you're not really supposed to generally do this without being very careful. And then dashed white is like separating two lanes where all the traffic's going the same direction, so you can pretty much cross over. Probably want to put your turn indicator on, but off you go, okay? So let's talk about how that works for these three camps. First, let's talk about controller talking to the model. The controller can talk to the model all at once. It knows everything about the model. It can send any message it wants to the model. The controller is in complete control of the model, okay? And the controller needs that because the controller's job is to present what's in the model to the user or to get information from the user and update the model. So it needs full control. So that's a full green arrow, dashed white road sign, road line there, can do anything it wants. Same thing on the other side. The controller obviously needs to be able to use its minions however it wants to display the model. And most of the time, the connection between the controller and its minions is via an outlet. And you remember we had an outlet on Monday, right? It was the display. You remember that? It was a var instance variable. Display was a UI optional UI label. And that connection is how the controller was talking to its view, okay? That label, that UI label was part of its view. It was a minion in its view. Okay, so that's full green communication. You can kind of do whatever it wants. Controller knows everything about both sides. It has to. Let's talk about the model and the view. Those never speak to each other. Why is that? Simple. The model is UI independent. So there's absolutely nothing it has to say to the view, which is completely UI dependent. That's all the view is. The view is just the minions of the controller. And so, you know, it makes no sense for these two to talk to each other. So that's fire. That's double yellow line. Don't ever do that in this class, okay? No communication there at all. Okay, all communication between the model and the view goes through the controller. All right, what about from the view to the controller? Can the view, like a label and stuff like that, talk to its controller? Well, yes and no. The problem with the view is all the minions in there are generic objects, like UI button or UI label. Those were written by Apple years ago. They know absolutely nothing about a calculator. So there's no way to kind of, for them to talk to a calculator and know it's a calculator, okay? So there's limited communication between the view and the controller. But of course the view needs to talk to the controller because it's the controller's minions and things happen in the UI and needs to tell the controller what's going on. So the kind of communication we have there has to be blind and structured. Blind meaning the objects in the view don't know what class they're talking to, okay? Because view buttons don't know anything about calculator view controllers. Uh, and it's structured because since there is no knowledge of the 
objects on either end. They have to communicate in a well-defined, predefined way. Okay? So let's talk about some of those structured ways that the view minions talk to the controller. One of them, you learned last time, is target action. Okay? So target action is very simple. The controller hangs a target on itself by defining a method with at sign IB action on it, usually in Xcode, so that little dot will work. Okay? And then the view, when it wants to talk to the controller, simply calls that method. And that connection, okay, the action being sent uh, from the view to the controller, is wired up, usually with control drag. You saw us do that. It can be done in code, but 99% of the time we control drag uh, to create this target action connection. So there's an example, very simple communication between a minion in the view, like a UI button, and the controller via the method. Okay? Simple one. All right, what else, what other kind of communication we have besides target action? Well, sometimes the view needs to communicate something a little more complicated than just, I was touched or something like that, okay? Uh, for example, it might be a scroll view. That's a generic view minion. And it might need to tell the controller, hey, uh, this guy just started scrolling, okay? Or the person zoomed into this zoom scale. All right, so it wants to notify the controller because the controller might need to know that and react to that, okay? Maybe it, it affects the model when you zoom in or out. Um, also, maybe the view, like the scroll view, needs to make sure it's okay to do something. Like if the scroll view says, should I allow vertical scrolling right now? Maybe it wants to ask the controller that. So you have a lot of messages that have words in them like should, will, and did, okay? That the minions want to ask questions uh, of the controller or involve the controller. Okay, so <coughs> this is done via what's called a delegate, and we're going to talk about delegation next week. And the word delegate is appropriate here because essentially the view's minions are delegating some responsibility to the controller. Okay, the way this is implemented is very simple. Delegate, the delegate is just a property in the view, and that property you might ask, what's the class of that property because, you know, uh, the view doesn't know anything about the calculator view controller. And the answer is that it's not going to be a class. It's going to be uh, what's called a protocol. Okay, and we're going to talk about what protocols are. Protocols are basically just a description of a bunch of methods that the other guy promises to implement. Okay, and so if you could imagine if the controller would promise to implement these will, should, and did things, then the view could talk to it, even if the view doesn't know what class it is. Okay, now similarly, there's an important aspect of MVC, which is that the views, okay, this view camp, cannot own the data they are displaying, okay? Now, how are they going to display it if they don't own it? Well, they're going to ask for it from the controller all the time, and the controller is going to get it from the model, okay? So that's another kind of protocol, but instead of will, did, and should, you've got messages in that protocol like, give me the data at this location, and how many pieces of data are there, okay? Things that are asking about the data, so the view can figure out what's going on uh, and display it, okay? And that's also done with delegation, although we call that delegate the data source, okay? So there'll be another property on some views uh, called the data source, which is this protocol-based pointer basically to another object, and the controller sets itself as that so that it can get involved in providing the data for the view. Okay? So those are the ways that the view can communicate to the controller. You can see they're all predefined, well-defined ways. They're not just open-ended. Okay? Now, uh, this leads to a situation where the controller's job can be described as interpreting and formatting the model data for the view. Okay? It also interprets view input for the model. So it's an interpreter between both. That's its controller's job. So that's really where all your UI logic is, is in there. Okay. How about the model? Can it talk directly to the controller? Absolutely not, because the controller is your UI logic, and the model is UI independent. So there's absolutely no way the model could have anything to say to the controller. However, what happens if the model, which is UI independent, has some data that changes? Okay? So it's maybe the model is representing data on a network, and someone is changing something on the network, and it's changing. How does the model let the controller know? Well, to do this, we use what we call a radio station model. Okay? So the radio station is just a thing that the model can set up, set up its own radio station, and it broadcasts on that radio station whenever anything interesting happens. Okay? And then the controller just tunes in to that station. So the model is not really talking to the controller, it's just talking to anyone who wants to know 
what's going on in the model. Now, all of that communication on that radio station, since it's done by the model, has nothing to do with UI. It's about the data in the model. I have new data, my data changed, those kind of messages are going out on this radio station, okay? Now, other radio stations can be work between other camps besides the model and the controller, and some have asked, hey, can I just create a view that tunes into the model directly and short circuit the controller? And the answer is no, you don't want to do it that way. Okay, you would want to have the controller tuning in to the model and have the controller set up this generic view thing to display the data. Question? From a conceptual standpoint, it's easy to understand what the controller and the view are. Are the model just like your idea of how those two things are implemented in the software? Uh, so the question is, uh, so it's easy to understand uh, what the controller and view are. They're displaying the UI. Uh, the model, it's less easy to kind of conceptualize what that is. So what is the model? Um, really, the model, it takes a little more design, but you, to design the model, you have to think about what is it my app does fundamentally, n independent of how it would be displayed. Like imagine I wanted a calculator and it had a command line interface where I could type five times three equals and it would work. Okay, well, that's a user interface, but the calculation, the actual multiplication and stuff, that would be in the model. So the model is more about trying to understand what it is your application does, not how it's displayed. That's the separation that we have to do in this design. So it's kind of like an algorithmic implementation. Yeah, it's more the algorithms, the data, the databases and stuff like that are more in the model. And you'll see it by experience. We'll do it with the calculator today and you'll get an example of how that plays out. Um, okay, now this all only builds one MVC. Okay, one MVC generally an iOS controls one iPhone screen. Or maybe on an iPad it's two pieces or three different pieces on the iPad screen. In other words, this is only controlling a little part of your app. To build a real app, we have to take these MVCs, make a whole bunch of them, and combine them. Okay, that's how we make a big app. All right? Now, when we do that, it's just still important that the communication is well defined. And basically, the MVC, an MVC can only serve as part of the view of another MVC. Okay? Do you see how this is arranged up here? If you look at any of the purple controllers up there, you notice that any arrow they have to another MVC goes out that view side. Okay? So we always want to think of these MVCs as part of the view of another MVC. And there's some MVCs like tab bar controller, that's an MVC that's provided to iOS, where you might have three or four other MVCs as part of its view. And those are the things when you press on the tabs at the bottom, you see a different MVC, right? So that's what we built an app of four MVCs, let's say. One of them is the top level tab bar controller, and then we have, let's say, three uh, other MVCs. And those three MVCs might do completely independent things. And as we build this, we really want each MVC to be completely self-contained. Just like when we design objects, we want them to be completely self-contained. We don't want them reaching into the internal implementations of other objects, right? So in some sense, we're building an object-oriented system here out of MVCs as well. Okay, now you'll see how all this works. In week three, we'll start doing multiple MVCs and it'll all make sense. Okay. One thing we don't want to do, of course, is build something where the MVCs are not working together. If these arrows start going in every which way and direction, then there's going to be no way to understand how your app works once it gets to a certain complexity. It's just going to be beyond your comprehension, okay? So we don't want this. This is bad. All right, so the demo I'm going to dive right into here. Again, this is a slide you can look at later, important things that I'm going to cover in this demo. Because uh, I'm not coming back to the slides, let me summarize uh, what's coming up. Uh, on Friday, we do have this debugging um, session. It's at 1.30 in this room, okay? I uh, highly recommend you go to that, uh, especially if you've never done debugging in Xcode, because you'll kind of be wondering how the heck it all works otherwise. Uh, next Monday, we'll be talking about more Swift. That's when your first reading assignment is due, and your second reading assignment will go out. And then next Wednesday, we're going to start about talking about custom drawing in iOS. What if we want to not just use a button and, and a label, but we want to draw our own stuff? Uh, and that's when programming assignment one will be due before lecture, and assign program assignment <coughs> two will go out after lecture. Okay? Any questions before I jump into this demo? All righty. Here we go. I'm just going to pick up right where we left off with, I'm going to go to developer here. Here's our calculator. All right. I'm going to, when I want to relaunch it, I could just uh, launch and get the splash screen here um, and then click on this to open it. And here it is. And uh, before, if you remember where we were, we only had a pie button and then uh, the keypad. And that was great. 
Um, so now we want to add more buttons. That's what we're going to do. We're going to add more operations and more sophisticated operations like multiply and things like that. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about a feature in Swift that can really make your code read a lot better. You notice here that we have this type conversion, string and pi, right? Where this is the, when the pi button is pressed, we have to convert pi, which is a double, to a string. Well, if I think ahead about all the operations I'm going to want to add to my calculator, they're all doubles. Everything is doubles, not strings. Okay? So am I really going to have, for all these operations, all kinds of converting back and forth between strings and doubles as I try to put the result into the display or get the number out of the display? That is going to end up being really tedious. Okay? And it's going to make my code kind of a mess, lots of type conversions back and forth. Wouldn't it be cool if I had a var called display value, which was a double? And this var automatically tracked what was in that display. In other words, if I ever got the value of this, it would be the value in the display as a double. And if I ever set the value of this, it would set the display. Wouldn't that be cool? Right? That would make all the rest of my code a lot easier because I'd be all in double land and not having to be doing this string conversion. And the answer is we can absolutely do that kind of var, a var that tracks something else. Okay, this var, our user is in the middle of typing, is just stored. That true false value is stored somewhere with this object. Um, this one, instead of being stored, it's going to be calculated. Okay? And we call this a computed property. And we do it just by putting curly braces after it. Okay? And inside these curly braces, we're going to put some code to calculate the value of this property, both when we get it okay, and when we set it. So we have this get and set um, keywords here. And inside here, we just put code to get the value of display value. And set is the code that gets executed when someone tries to set the value of this var. Okay? Super simple. So, What's the implementation of this? Really easy. When someone tries to get the display value, I'm just going to return the display's text, okay, unwrapped. But of course, this is a string, right? Okay? And this is supposed to be returning a double. So I need to convert this string to a double. So I'm going to say double like that. Okay? Now, this is still not going to work, okay? Why is that? Let's look at our error. It says the value of optional double is not unwrapped. Look, it's trying to unwrap this. Okay, that's really weird. See, it's putting an exclamation point at the end of this double. I didn't have to do that down here. When I converted from this double to a string, I didn't unwrap it. Why is this, I'm trying to create a double here using this string. Why do you think this is returning an optional double instead of a double? Correct. It might not be convertible, right? If I press hello in there as the string, double of hello, I don't know. Okay. Now, again, it could return zero or something else, but really it wants to say, I don't know. I can't do it. And the best way to do that is with an optional. So some constructors, okay, some of these initializers for various classes can return optional versions of the thing in, in, in the case where they can't necessarily create one for you. Okay? So that's really kind of awesome. So let's go ahead and unwrap that. Okay, now this would again, this would crash if we ever put hello in here, it's going to crash. So we're kind of designing our code, assuming this is always going to have a number. How about setting it? Okay, here we want to set the display's text equal to what the person is setting the display value to. Okay, when someone sets the display value, they're going to say in their code, display value equals five. Right? So how do I get the five? in here, in this set? And the answer is there's a special keyword called new value. Okay? This new value is going to be the double that somebody set. Okay? Display value equals something. Now, I want to put that in display text, but of course this, what type is this right here? It's a double, right? Because they said display value equals something, and it's a double. And this has got to be a string, so I've got to convert this to a string, just like I did below that. Okay, you can always convert a double to a string, so there's no optional uh, stuff going on. And that's it. Okay, I've now invented a new property uh, that is calculated. And every time I ask for its value, I'm going to get what's in the display as a double, and every time I set it, it's going to set the display. Pretty cool, huh? And it makes our code, like down here, a lot better. Instead of having this go down here, we're just going to say display value equals pi. Okay, we don't need to do this type conversion and reference display text. Okay? Everyone understand that? 
And this is going to make it a lot easier to add new things. Let's add another property or a, another um, operation here. I'm going to add square root. Okay, so let's go here and do square root. The square root symbol I'm going to get from the edit. If you go into edit menu of most Mac apps, you'll see this emoji and symbols thing at the bottom. It brings up this uh, window or you can have a lot of emoji, but you can also have math symbols. And uh, down here, here's square root. It's the square root symbol, okay? So I'm going to put the square root symbol on this button. Square root, okay? And um, then it's already wired up. If I hold over here, you can see it's hooked up because I copy and pasted the pi button. Uh, we can see it's okay here because I didn't copy and paste a digit button. If I right click on it, we can see that it's only going to send perform operation. All right, so that's all good. And all I need to do here is say if the mathematical symbol equals uh, that square root thing, then the display value equals the square root of the display value. Okay? So you can see that this code is really nice. If I didn't have that, I would have had to get the display text, convert it to a double, do the square root, convert it back to a string, put it back in display text. See how that would have been a mess? Okay, and this is only just the very first one I added. Um, when we, if we add a whole bunch more, we're gonna, it's going to be even more and more leverage to have this thing. But mostly I'm showing you this because I want you to see what computed properties look like. We use them all the time in Swift. Um, we're going to use them yet again in this demo, and you should get comfortable with the fact that not all your properties are stored. Some of them might be computed like this. All right. I want to add more operations now, but I have to be careful here because this code really does not belong in my controller, okay? Because this is the code of what my app is. It's a calculator, and I'm doing calculations here. So this needs to move into a model class. Okay, so now it's time to do MVC here and move this stuff into a model class. So what's our model class going to look like? Let's create it and kind of design an API for it, and then we'll get back and use it here. Okay, so to create it, okay, in fact, to create any new file in Xcode, you're going to go File, New, File. Okay, File, New, File. And when you go here, it's going to say, what kind of file do you want to create? And of course, we want to create an iOS source file, okay, not watch OS or something. And here we're going to create a Swift file. If we were creating a Cocoa Touch class, like a new view controller, we would go here. But if we're going to create just a model class, we go here. So I'm going to double click. It's going to say, where do you want to put this? I'm going to put it in the same group calculator that all my other Swift files are in. You see, viewcontroller.swift there. I'm going to call it calculator brain, because it's going to be the brain of our calculator. It's going to be the model uh, for our calculator. I'm going to click create. Here it is right here. You can see that the very first thing, it imports foundation, not UI kit. Okay? Never import UI kit in a model file because the model is UI independent. So it would never do that. If you find yourself importing UI kit, you're doing it wrong. Okay? So foundation is what we want. Foundation is that core services layer, kind of the basic stuff, non-UI uh, based stuff. By the way, let me show you how you can put different things on each side. So I've got calculator brain over here. What if I want to have my controller still be over here? And you do that with these things at the top. Okay, the top line here is actually changeable. You can pick other things to show. So for example, I can go show my controller here. Okay, that way I can have them both on screen at the same time, which is kind of convenient, especially if I have a class that I'm using in another class. I can see its API here and use it over here. All right, so I'm going to create a new class called Calculator Brain. We know how to do that. Brain, we know how to do that. Okay, class, Calculator Brain. What's its superclass? No superclass, right? Calculator Brain, this model, it doesn't inherit from anything, doesn't need to inherit anything. Okay, so it's just a base class. All right, now let's talk about what its API is. Everyone knows the phrase API. I hope that means the interface through which we're going to be programming using this. Uh, calculator brain. It's all the methods and properties in it. So um, I'm going to do a little function called set operand, okay, which just takes a double. Okay, that's going to be part of it. So if I'm using my calculator brain, I'm going to set an operand. Then I'm going to have another function in here called perform operation, which is going to operate on that operand. And the argument there is going to be a string, which is the mathematical symbol. Okay. And then lastly, I'm going to have a var which is the result of the operation, which is going to be a double. And I'm going to do something interesting here. Um, instead of just having this be a, 
public var that could be set and got because the setting of this doesn't really make sense for anyone using my calculated brain to set this. I set it internally, okay, because of form operation. So I'm actually going to make this computed and only implement the get side of it, okay? I'm not going to implement the set. So now this becomes a read-only property. Do you, do you all remember another read-only property we used last time? Current title and button. Okay, so current title and button is a computed read-only property in button. That title, that current title, is probably gotten from a UI label or something that the button is using to draw its title. Okay, it comes from somewhere else. That's why it's computed. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing here. So this is how you can make a property be read-only to the callers. Okay, yeah. So can we use the get for comparison, not just for assignment? <coughs> like with equal, equal sign? Okay, so the question is, is the get used for comparison? Well, comparison is actually quite interesting in Swift. Um, the equals equals operator is like a function, and it takes those two sides as arguments, and those two sides have to implement certain methods if they want to be comparable. Okay? Now, we're not, we're not far enough along in terms of our understanding of Swift to see exactly how that works, um, but the answer to your question succinctly is no. The get really doesn't have anything to do with equality. Equality is just a function that is different, okay? All right, so uh, I'm going to return zero for right now, okay? Um, just to get rid of my little, uh, error there. But eventually we're going to have to implement this uh, internally and make it work. Now, I want to talk a little bit about APIs right here, okay? So far, every method and property we've done in this whole class has been essentially public meaning any class can call any of the methods in any of the classes we created, okay? For example, all of our controller vars, okay, and functions could all be called by some other class. Now, that's bad, okay, that's bad. For example, the display value, we wouldn't want some other class setting the display value in the calculator through this controller because we manage that display value by what our model calculates, right? So, this is internal implementation. In fact, all of this is internal implementation of our controller. We do not want other classes to be able to call it. Unlike these three, which are external, okay? They, we want people calling these in calculator brain. That's how our calculator brain works. If people couldn't call this, they couldn't even use the calculator brain. So how do we specify that difference between something that should be called by other people or not? We do that with the private keyword. So I'm going to add private, okay, this private keyword right here, to all of my functions and methods over here. Uh, I don't, this is not really part of Swift again. This is kind of an Xcode thing, so I put it after that. Um, but otherwise, we put it there, and we're going to put it for all of these. We're going to make all of these be private. And as you program, okay, you're going to see that one of the evaluation criteria on your homework is that you properly make things private when they should be private. And I generally would err on the side of making it private. It's a lot easier to make something private and go back later and decide to make it public than to leave something public, have a whole bunch of code start using it, and then decide, no, no, I want that to be private. Uh, then you break all those other people. So err on the side of private first and then making things public. Okay? Now, it's actually possible to look at something and see what its public interface is by going up here to the top and picking generated interface. This will show you the public API of the class in the main window on the left there. So we're going to look at the public API of Calculator Brain. You can see that it has set operand, perform operation, and result. Notice this looks just like current title, right, where it's saying this is a read-only thing. We don't see any implementation here. This is purely the API, okay? It's no implementation here. Also notice this says internal. You would think this might say public, okay, but there's actually a slight difference between internal and public. Internal means it's public within your module, Public would mean it's public to everyone in other modules. So consider UIKit. UIKit has hundreds of public methods that we can call, but it also has hundreds if not thousands of internal methods that only other UIKit classes can call between themselves. We don't even know what they are. Okay? So, but for your purposes, since you're always going to be working in the module, which is your app, internal means public, basically. Let's go look at our controller now, and let's look at its public API. Okay? So here I selected it. We look over here, and it says, oh, there's only one public thing. User is in the middle of typing. I didn't mean that to be public. I wanted that to be private, too. I just forgot to put the private on there. So if I go back over here and say private, okay, then you'll see it goes away. So now we have no public API here. 
Now, it's still completely usable because in Interface Builder, uh, we can wire up to this controller and make it appear in a tab bar controller, all those things. We can do all that without having any of the internal methods here be public. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my, oops, sorry, go back to my brain over here. Got my controller over here. All right, so I got brain and controller. So let's think about how we can use this model over here. Okay, we haven't implemented this yet, but we've defined its public API. So how can we use that over here? Well, we really want to replace all this business with using our model, right? Because this is where we were doing model things, calculations. So we don't want that, okay? We want to get rid of that, and we want to start using our model here. Well, to have a model in our controller, we need to be able to talk to it, that big green arrow, okay? So we need a private var, which I'll call brain, which is going to be a calculator brain, okay? And this is the var that we're is going to create our we're going to create our calculator brain, and we're going to talk to it to do all the calculations, okay? So this is just that big green arrow I showed you on that those previous slides where the controller talks through this to get to the model. Now, um, how about creating this thing? Where do we create this? Well, you can see that we have an error up here. No initializers again. That's because this var, like any other, has to be initialized. And I'm going to create a calculator brain here. And to do that, I have to call one of its initializers. And every time you create a new class, you get one free initializer, which is an initializer that takes no arguments. Okay? Kind of the basic initializer. So I'm using that calculator brain initializer. It came for free. Uh, I don't have anything that I need to initialize anyway, so uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so I've created it. Now, notice that this right here, do we need this? No, because Swift can infer that brain is a calculator brain from that equal sign right there. Okay, so we do not want to put colon calculator brain there. All right, so now that we have this brain, okay, and it's created here, we can use it, use its public API right here, to make things work. Well, one thing we know is that when the mathematical symbol comes through here, we want to ask the brain to perform that operation. Okay, so we're going to pass that mathematical symbol as the operation. We know that. We also probably know that after it's done performing the operation, we probably want to put in the display the result, the brain's result, this thing right here, right? And also at the beginning of the perform operation, if we're in the middle of typing a number, we better set that number as the operand for the calculator to work on. If we go 235 square root, we've got to put that 235 in as the operand for the brain. So we better say if the user is in the middle of typing a number, then brain set operand to be whatever's in the display. You can see even here, having this display value thing makes our code read really beautifully. Okay, we could probably put this inside this if because no need to set it false if it's not, if it's unless it's already true. Okay, so that's it. That's all we need to do to hook our model up to our controller. Okay, and we've removed everything in our controller that has to do with actually calculating. We've basically given it all off to the the model to do. So now we have to implement this. Okay, we've got to implement this brain over here. I'm going to make that be the main. Uh, window here, and how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to have a data structure here for my brain, which makes pretty much sense, which is going to be private, which is going to be called accumulator. It's going to be a double, and it's going to accumulate the result. Okay, as operations are performed, it's accumulating the result. Okay, anyone who knows how a calculator is built, it has internal <coughs> accumulator. So this is our accumulator. Um, notice that I, as soon as I put this in here, I get this error again. Calculator brain has no initializers. That's because I don't initialize this. So I'm going to say this equals 0.0. .0. Once I do that, I do not need this because 0, 0.0, Swift always infers that, or any something dot something, it always infers it to be a double. Okay? So that makes this be a double, you see? If I made this no dots, just zero, then it's going to infer this as an int. Okay, so good thing to know there. So now that I have my accumulator, the result is always just the current state of my accumulator. So that's the easy implement a result. And same thing, when someone sets the operand, that kind of resets my accumulator to be whatever that operand is. 
Okay? So those are all easy to implement. So that just leaves this guy, perform operation. That's the heart of my model. That's the thing that's really going to do some calculation. Now, I could, right here, just go back to what I was doing in my controller, which is to uh, have a, some if-then-elses here, or actually I'm going to use switch. Okay, so switch is the same as in other language, but much more powerful in Swift and also much more important in Swift, as you will see. Okay, switch uh, is a very important thing in Swift. So I can switch on the symbol that's legal to switch on a string. Okay, and I just put the cases that I want to try. So we have, for example, pi. And if pi happens, I want to set my accumulator equal to pi. Okay, if it was, for example, uh, Square root, let's go do that. My square root symbol back, here it is. So if we had square root, then I'm just going to say that my accumulator equals the square root of the accumulator. Okay? So this is basically getting us back to exactly where we were before, but now we have a model. Notice we have an error here. That's because one thing about switch, you must consider every possible value of this thing you're switching on. Now this is a string. So it has infinite possibilities, okay? Now, we could spend the next few years saying case A colon. No, we don't want to do that. Instead, we're going to put default break. So default means if you can't match any of these other ones, then just break out of this, okay? Now, notice my indentation's gotten a little wonky here. I'm going to teach you something fun. If you select a curly braced region, including your whole file, and hit control I, It'll reformat it, okay? Relay it out. And I strongly recommend that when you turn your homework in, you select all and do control I, okay? That way you'll be using the default indentation. Even if you prefer something else, use the default one because people reading your code are going to be able to understand it better, okay? And believe me, you'll adjust to whatever indentate indentation style this thing enforces on you, okay? If you start getting, if you're a computer scientist and you start getting religious about things like indentation, um, you're headed down a pretty rocky road, okay? Because when you go out and work in the real world, you're going to have companies that say, this is the way we do it. Get used to it. And if you say they're whining, I don't like to do it that way, well, you probably get fired, okay? So don't do that. So here we're just going to let the Xcode uh, do our indentation for us. So this is all we need to do right here. Okay, this is a full implementation. We can go back and run our app, and it's exactly the way it was before, but now we're using a model. Okay? So here we go. Let's try four or five. That's working. Square root. That looks like, like it's working. We'll just be sure by picking a number we know the square root of. Pi seems to work. Square root. Okay, so we're back to where we were. That's nice. Now, the thing about this now is I'm about to go add a whole bunch more operations here. And if for every single one I have to do the math, do the math, do the math, each one, this is going to be a lot of duplicated code in here. Because every time I have a unary operation like square root, it's exactly the same. If I have cosine or square root or anything, it's exactly the same. It's just the only difference is these four characters, square root or cosine or whatever. Same thing for these constants. Only this part will be different on every line, even for binary like multiply or whatever. It's probably only the function that does the calculation that's going to be different. So I want to factor this stuff out so that all of these things, like pi and square root and multiply, are in a table. Okay? And I'm just going to have this only be doing the generic calculations, generic constants, generic unary operations, generic binary operations. And it's going to look in the table to find out what to do. Doesn't that seem like a much better design, more extensible, less code, et cetera? So that's what we're going to do. So let's create that table, okay? And we're going to call that table operations, and it's going to be the class, it's actually not a class, dictionary, okay? So dictionary is a Swift thing. It is a generic type. You're probably used to that in Java. So you specify right here when you're declaring this what the keys and values are, what type. And so I want one, I'm going to start out just doing the constants. Let's just have this table only do constants, okay, like pi, okay? So I'm going to have my keys be string, That'll be the uh, name of the constant, like the pi character or whatever. And the value is going to be a double. So that'll be like m under, bar, and m under bar pi or whatever. Okay? So I've declared it here. Now I'm actually going to initialize it, because remember I have to initialize all my vars. You can initialize a dictionary right on the fly, just by using this open square bracket uh, notation. And you just put, like, for example, pi, because key, colon, m under bar pi is a value. 
Okay, so I'm basically filling up the dictionary here. Let's do another constant. How about E? That's M under bar E. Everyone know what E is? 2.71 or whatever it is. Okay, so we could add a whole bunch more uh, of these things into our table. Again, we're only doing constants right now. We're not doing square root and those kind of things. So that changes my code over here. Instead of having all that stuff right there, I'm just going to let the constant equal operations sub symbol. So this is how you look something up in a dictionary. Okay, here's the name of the dictionary right here. And you look it up with square brackets and the thing to look up. Okay, and now I could just say my accumulator equals that constant. Okay, but this is not going to work. Why? Let's find out. Error, it says, value of optional double, question mark, not unwrapped. Uh-oh, it's optionals again. Okay. What's happening here? It wants to unwrap constant. In other words, it's saying this is an optional double. Why would the thing, this dictionary does not contain optional doubles, it contains doubles. So why would looking this symbol up in that dictionary return an optional double? Anybody have an idea? Someone besides you, because you got it right before. Yeah? Correct, exactly the same thing as before, okay? This dictionary might not contain that key that we're looking up. So it's going to return nil to say I couldn't find it. So we simply need to unwrap it. Now, this is dangerous because maybe somebody is using my API and they perform an operation that I don't understand. Now I'm going to crash. That's not very friendly. So here I'm going to use if, the if let, and set my accumulator. And I'm just going to ignore any operation that I don't understand. I'm not going to affect my accumulator. Just leave it. OK? All right, so let's run. Make sure this works. All right, so the square root's not going to work because we don't have <coughs> square roots in our table here. We only have constants, but we have these is still working and pi is still working. Okay, so that's good. So we didn't break pi at least. And if we had an E key, then the E key would work as well. All right, now we want to extend this to do square root. Okay, how the heck we're going to do that? I mean, really what we want to do is just say square root. Oops, keep doing that, square root. Let's get our friendly neighborhood symbol for square root here. Okay, square root, we really want to put square root right here, okay, the square root function. That's really what I want to, what I want to do. And like if I had cosine, I'd really want to put the cosine function here, okay? Now, this is obviously not a double. That's not gonna work. So this can't be a double. This has to be something else. Okay, it has to be something that would work for a double and would also work for a function. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to implement a new type, okay, and it's similar to class. It's called enum. Okay, I'm going to call this enum operation. And inside this enum, I'm going to have all the different kinds of operations I know how to do. Now, you're probably used to enum in other languages. What is an enum in most languages? It is a discrete set of values, right? An enum has to have discrete values. Same thing in Swift. It has a discrete value. So, for example, it might be a constant, or maybe it's a unary operation, or it might be a binary operation, or maybe it's equals, the equal sign, which is kind of a special operation, okay? So enums are the same. What's different about enums in Swift is that they're like classes in that they can have methods, okay? So I can go down here and say func, you know, something, take some arguments, return something. I can do that down here, okay? Enums are allowed to have um, methods. Now, they can't have any vars, okay? Uh, they can have computed vars, but they can't have any storage vars because this is essentially their storage, okay? The enum. The other thing about them is they cannot have inheritance. So you can't have a new enum that inherits from another uh, enum, which probably would be weird anyway, um, so that's not much of a restriction, okay? The other thing about enums is they're passed by value, and I'm just gonna postpone talking about that until I show you struct, which is another pass by value data structure in a moment, okay? So here's operation, that's great. So now I can change pi, uh, that's an operation.constant, okay? Comment that out for a second. This is also an operation a constant. Uh, this is an operation dot unary operation. Okay, and this is also an operation dot unary operation. Okay, cool. So we can now change this double to the type operation. 
Okay? And errors go away. These are all operations. It all works. Now, small problem here is that we've lost track of the actual constants and uh, functions. We've commented them out. They're not even involved here. So this obviously has not solved the problem. It's a step on the way to solving the problem, but it has not solved the problem. All right, the other thing is, obviously down here, looking up constants like this and making the accumulate, this doesn't work. This only works for constants, so we're not going to do that. So how do we look things up now for operations? Well, we're going to do a similar thing here, okay? We're going to say let, we can if, if let operation equal operations sub symbol, okay? But now this operation <laughs> is going to be one of these, okay? It's going to be one of these enums, right? If I click on it, you see? It's a calculator brain dot operation. Oh yeah, notice also I defined this enum inside this class. So its full name is calculator brain dot operation. You can nest these things. You can put even put classes inside classes if you want. And they'll just, it's just a namespace thing, right? The names will be whatever, dot, whatever, dot, whatever. Okay? Um, so I've got the operation there. Now I'm going to switch on this operation. And I know that the cases can be constant. Okay? And we, and I'll just break on all these for now. So it could be a constant. Uh, it could be a unary operation. It could be um, a binary operation. Uh, or it could be equals. Okay, and remember in switch I have to define every single option, but I don't need default here because there are only four possible things that an operation could be. So I've got a case for all of them in my switch. Question? Why is operation, are we not referring to the same operation um, as the enum in the, in the form operation method? Because it's not capitalized. Oh uh, yeah, this operation, yeah. not capitalized, makes it a local, we're making it a local variable here, yeah. And actually that's a really good opportunity for me to talk about um, how you capitalize, okay? All types, you want to be capitalized. Like calculator brain, dictionary, operation, string, double, do you notice they all are capitalized? Operate, everything, okay, is capitalized. All Local variables and vars, lowercase first letter, and then capital letter for all the subsequent um, words in there. So it's called camel case. You guys know, have heard of that before. Um, so that's how you want to do all your naming. If you don't do that, you're going to get in trouble with me. Okay? So I know some people like to use lowercase for class names. Forget it. You can't do it in Swift. Just don't do it. Okay? It'll be allowed, but you'll get in trouble. So don't do it. Okay? Uh, well, you had a second question? Yeah. Why are we using the dot for the constants? Are we referring to operation dot? Okay. So that's my confusion. Exactly. So why did I say dot constant here instead of just saying constant? And the answer is, yeah, really we're doing operation dot constant, but Swift can infer that it must be operation because it knows this is an operation. Okay? Is that because it's within the operations dictionary? It's between the, the it's part of the enum for operation. You see, operation is not really, we're not inside the dictionary here. We pulled it already out of the dictionary. So how does it know, is it intelligent enough to distinguish, even though you've included a lowercase operation, that it's referring to the enum with the uppercase operation? Oh, OK, it knows that this lowercase operation is a, a capital operation okay. because I pulled it out of this dictionary. Right. And it knows that that dictionary has operations as its value. Okay. So when I pulled out its value, it knew it. There you go. All right. So this is all going good, except for, again, we don't have the pi and the e and the square root and the cosine in here. So how are we going to get those things in there? And the answer is, you actually already know it. You've heard it before. Associated values. OK? Remember, optional has that associated value. All enums have associated value. In fact, optional is an enum. OK? This is what optional looks like. If you were to look at it, enum, optional, case, none, that's the nil case, case, sum, with associated value, t, and then optional is generic type, just like dictionary, it has this generic type. So this t could be any type, and that's how optional works. Okay? So we can do the same thing down here. We could associate, for example, a double with constants. Okay, because constants need a double, m under bar pi, we need that thing. Okay, and so we're doing the same thing that optional does, associating a value um, with our constants. So we have this constant double, then here when we declare the constant, we have to provide the associated value, which is m under bar pi. Okay, now we can get rid of our comment there. 
Same thing here, we can take this m under bar e and associate it with this constant. Oops. Okay, see how we're doing that association? Now, how do we get this associated value out when we're looking at a constant down here? Right, here we switched on the operation. We know that this is a constant, right? We looked it up in the operations dictionary and we found that it's a constant, let's say, like this one. How do we get it? You do that by right here saying let associated, you know, constant value or whatever you want to call. This is, this is just a local variable. You can call it anything you want. Okay? That will make this local variable glom onto the associated value. Okay? And so now we can say accumulator equals the associated constant value. Okay? So that's why I said switch is really powerful. It does this kind of pattern matching to get these associated values out. So you do that with switch. Okay? Now, associated constant value, kind of yucky. I'm just going to call it value. Okay? I only called it that long thing just to show you it could be called anything and that it is the associated value, but you would probably call it value. Okay? You got that? All right. Let's run and see if this works. It's only going to work for constants because that's the only one we're We've done any associated values for yet. But here we go, this is still working. Pi works. Okay, square root not implemented yet. All right, so let's do square root. Okay, so square root, what would be the associated value of a unary operation? Don't be shy. What? A function, yes, it's a function. Okay, so how do we make a function be associated value here. Well, the lucky thing is that in Swift, functions are types just like any other type. Okay? There's no difference in Swift's mind between a function type and a double. Exactly the same. Can be used in all the same circumstances. Arguments to functions, associated values, local variables, anything can be of type a function. And not only that, it's not a generic function, it's a function with certain arguments and return values. And how do you declare such a type? How do you say that that's a type here? You just type it. So this is a function that takes a double and returns a double. Okay? That's the associated value of unary operation. It's a function. So here, when we want to associate a value, we have to put in here, just like we put a double here for this one, right? Here we have to put a function that takes a double and returns a double, like, oh, I don't know, square root. Okay? Or maybe cosine. Okay? Everybody got that? Now, same thing down here. We got to grab that associated value. So here I'm going to say let. And again, I could say associated function, but I'm just going to call this function. Okay? Now I have this is a local variable of type function that takes a double and returns a double. That's its type. Okay? That's the type of this function. In fact, watch. Alt click on it. Look at its type. It's a function that takes a double, returns a double. How do I use a variable like that? Well, I use it just like a function. Accumulator equals function of accumulator. Oops, not accessor. Accumulator. Okay? Now, again, this is just a local variable. I could call this foo. And then I would put foo here. Okay? This is a local variable, that's all it is, and it happens to be, its type is a function that takes a double, returns a double. All right, everybody cool with that? All right, let's run again, see if this is working. All right, so 81 square root, excellent. Okay, it's executing this associated value. It looked up that square root, found that it was a unary operation with this, associated value, went down here and perform operation, found it here, grabbed that associated value, and then I used it to update my accumulator. Question? So, so if you're specifying the types, then I'm surprised that your enough uh, operation does not require the whole case, because your dictionary could potentially just call anything, any kind of <coughs> value. Well, no, the dictionary can only have an operation in it, right? It can only have one of these. And this only has four possible cases. Even though any given case might have any associated value, it's still the actual case of that operation. It's only these four. 
So down here when I switch on it, I only have to cover those four cases, no more. Okay. All right, what about binary operation? Okay, well, binary operation, a little more complicated. And why is it more complicated? Because if you think about the way a binary operation works like multiply, three times five equals. Okay, well, when I press times, I don't have enough information to update the accumulator yet. I need the three and then the equals. It's only when the equals is hit that I have enough information to actually do it. So in binary operation here, I'm still going to grab that binary function out of there, okay? But I can't actually perform that function like I can here. So I'm going to have to salt away that function and the um, operand so far and wait till equals happens, then I can do it. Okay, but I still need, just like unary operation, I need to have an associated value with a binary operation. What do you think that looks like? Another function, right, that takes two doubles and returns a double. Okay, like multiply. So that's just a different kind of function. Okay, and so now I can go up here and add multiply. So let's go ahead and get the, a multi, the mathematical symbol for multiply out of my emoji and symbols. Here it is right here, multiply, okay? And that is an operation that's binary operation. And look, it wants a function that takes two doubles and returns a double. So I'm going to put a function in there called multiply, which doesn't exist in Swift, so I'm going to have to go write that. Um, oh, by the way, we have another uh, thing here, which is equals which is operation.equals, okay? So it's a kind of a special operation there, okay? So it's complaining here because multiply doesn't exist, all right? So I'm going to write multiply. Here it is, I'm gonna make it a global function even, just like square root. Func multiply, okay, takes one argument that is a double, takes another argument that's a double, returns a double, and it just returns op1 times op2, okay? So I've created this new function multiply, here it is, and uh, I can now use it right here. Sound good? You understand that? Question? Um, why is that outside the class? Yeah, so why did I put this outside? Because I wanted it to be a function, a global function, not a method in this class. Okay? Um, so I just wanted scope to be wider. So it's more of a style? Yeah, it's kind of a style thing, a little more of a style thing. All right, so, uh, so now we have this binary option uh, uh, operation here. We have to salt away the binary function like times and the accumulator so far, the five in five times three equals the five and the times we have to wait, uh, salt them away. So I'm gonna salt them away in a data structure and it gives me a chance to teach you another data structure. You know class, you know enum. Here's another one called struct. Okay, now you know struct from other languages, of course. I'm gonna call this struct pending binary operation info, okay? And it's just gonna contain these two things I want. One of them is the binary function that I'm going to do. What's the type of this? Something that takes two doubles and returns a double, that's its type. See, I'm just declaring, that is a type. It's a type like any other type, like int, okay? Um, we also need to keep track of the first operand for this binary function, which is going to be the accumulator so far, and that's going to be of type double, okay? Now, what is a struct? Okay, we know class, we know enum, what's struct? Okay, struct is very much like class, almost identical, okay? It can have vars, stored vars, and computed vars. No inheritance, okay? But the big difference between struct and class is that structs, like enums, are passed by value, whereas classes are passed by reference. Okay, what does that mean? All right, so passing something by reference means that that thing lives in the heap, okay, lives, lives in memory somewhere, and when you pass it around to methods or something like that, you're really passing a pointer to it. And so when you give it to someone else, they have the same one you have because you both just have a pointer to the same thing that lives in the heap. That's passing by reference, okay? Hopefully you know that much of computer science that that's passed by reference, okay? And that's what it means in this scenario. So if I have a class like calculator brain and I pass that brain around, I'm talking about the same calculator brain all the time. Now I could instantiate another one in the heap and have a different one, but, um, but I'm when I create one, I'm pointing to it and I'm passing it the pointer to it around. Pass by value means that when you pass it, it copies it, okay? 
some would think of it as it's being passed on the stack, the call stack of the function, but that's not necessarily how Swift implements it. But the semantics of it are that it is copied. So if you have, a, let's say, an array, which is a struct, okay, a double is a struct, it turns out, an int is a struct, a string is a struct, these are all structs. Okay, and so if I passed an array to some other method and then I added something to that array, it would not be added back in the caller's array. The caller would have that array without that thing added, okay, because it would get a copy of it. Now you would think, whoa, this is going to be really low performance because what if I had an array of 10,000 items and I passed it? It's going to copy 10,000 things? Oh my god, my code is just going to grind to a halt. No. Swift is really smart about when you pass a by value struct, it doesn't actually make a copy of it until you try and touch it. Okay? If you try to mutate it, then it'll make a copy as necessary. Maybe not even a full copy, but it'll mutate it. Um, so if you're passing something and you don't touch it, then you are going to be sharing it. Okay? But all of that is behind the scenes performance enhancement. You don't know anything about it. From your point of view, it copies it. Structs always get copied. Okay? Understand the difference there? Very important difference between structs and classes. And enums are like structs. All right, so I've got this right here. Now, notice that I didn't set these equal to anything, but I didn't get that warning, no initializers. You know, usually if I put a var in a class, if I don't put initialize, it says no initializers, right? So why is it not saying here? That's because for structs, unlike classes, classes we got a free initializer. What were the arguments to it? Nothing. Right? Like calculator brain parentheses, no argument. So that's the free initializer you get for classes. For struct, the free initializer you get is an initializer that, whose arguments are all of its vars, every one of its vars. Okay? So let's go ahead and call that because here in binary operation, I need to create one. So I'm going to create a private var here. Um, I'm going to call it pending. It's going to be of type pending binary operation info. And it's going to be an optional. So here I'm creating my first optional. It's an optional struct. Okay? Why am I making this optional? Because this pending binary operation info is only there if I have a pending binary operation. If I haven't typed times or divide or something, I don't have one of these. So I want this to be nil. Okay? I want this pending var that's holding this pending stuff to be nil at that point. And then when I have one, I'll set it to something. Okay? And that's exactly what I'm going to do here in binary operation. I'm going to say pending. That's this thing right here, okay? Equals a pending binary operation info. And when I open parentheses, look, I got a constructor for this pending binary operation that has these two things as its two arguments. See, binary function and first operand. So now I can provide these values. This is function, and the first operand is the accumulator, okay? <laughs> So now I've created one of these pending hoo-hahs right here. And that's all I've done. I press time. I'm doing 5 times 3 equals. I press the times. All I did was create one of these structs and put the times and the 5 in there. Now in equals right here, I'm going to say if pending does not equal nil, so if I have a pending operation, then I'm going to evaluate it. So 5 times 3 equals works. But if I just say 5 equals, I don't have any pending time, so I'm just going to ignore this. So I'm only going to do this if I have a pending one. And what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to set my accumulator equal to evaluating that pending function, which is pending unwrapped, because it's an optional, dot binary function called with the arguments of the pending first operand and my current accumulator. Okay, and now pending is nil because I no longer, I just handled that pending thing, so now I no longer have a pending operation anymore. That make sense? Okay, so let's go take a look and see if this works. All right, here we go, let's try, oh, we don't have a times button. So let's go back to our UI and add a times button. Well, in fact, we'll add all of our uh, binary operations here. Okay, so I'm gonna just copy and paste. Put this here, paste another one. Here we'll put all my binary operations across the top here. Paste. Okay, go here, we'll go to our Lemoji and symbols thing. Here's times. We'll put divide right next to times. Uh, we'll put plus right here. 
put minus right here. We could put some other buttons down here too, like maybe we'll put uh, cosine. Yeah, let's put cosine in there. Oops. Cosine. Did I have another one? E, I guess I had, right? Put E in there too. E. Let's also put um, a uh, equal sign. Got to have that. We'll put that down here. Equal sign. Um, and here, in this empty space, it's just begging me to put something there. I'm going to put period, because in your homework, you're going to have to add the capability to be able to enter floating point numbers. So you'll need this one, so I'll put it there for you. Okay? All right, so here's our nice UI. Looks really pretty. And let's run it. All right, let's try. Four times five equals. Whoa, it works. A miracle the first time. Okay, let's try something a little more complicated. How about this? Uh, well, let's do some other things. Square root still working. Cosine. Let's do like pi cosine. Ooh, that worked. Cool. All right, there's E, 2.71. Nice. Um, here's something that doesn't work, though. Watch this. Seven times eight times two times three. Uh-oh, this is not working. And this is not working because it's requiring me to press equals to evaluate binary operations. So I have to go 4 times 7 equals times 3 equals times A equals. Really what I want is an automatic equals anytime I press a binary operation. So I can go 4 times 5. When I go times, it doesn't equals, and then let me do it. So let's just do that real quick. Uh, let's go back to our brain. I'm just going to take this little thing that equals uses and make it into a function, private func. Um, we'll call it execute pending binary operation. It's just gonna, I'm just pasting in the exact same thing. I'm going to call that here, execute pending binary operation, and I'm also going to call it here. Okay, I personally like, if I have any of my cases that go on the second line, I like to put them all there. I just think it looks a little nicer than having some on the end. It doesn't really matter to Swift, but I just think it looks a little nicer. Okay, so we did that, so that'll fix that case. All right, the last two things I want to do, okay, let's change this word, 4 times 7 times 8 times 9 equals, okay? Now, the last thing, two things I want to do is, one, I'm going to show you how to make uh, divide and plus and minus work without creating a whole ton of these little extra functions like multiply, because that's really gross. And then second, I'm going to make our UI stretchy so it works with landscape and portrait. Okay, those are the two things I'm going to do. All right, so let's go ahead and make our other four operations here, uh, which is divide, plus, and minus. So I have to bring up our emoji again. Okay, so this one will make be divide, we'll make this one be plus, and we'll make this one be minus. Okay, now here I could have a function called divide, and another one called add, and another one called subtract, and then I could go up here and make one of these for divide, and one of these for add, and one, okay, but if I start doing that, what a mess, okay? I've hardly even gained anything by having this nice table of operations, but I also have to have a separate function for everything I want to do. Well, Swift is going to take care of us on that front because it implements closures. How many people know what closures are, the computer science term closures? Okay, hardly anybody. Woo, okay. So a closure, it's basically, you can think of it as an inline function. Okay, but it's an inline function that captures the state of its environment. And we're going to see why that's important later in the quarter. But for now, you can just focus on the inline function part of it. So I can actually take this multiply function, okay? I'm just going to select the function without the word multiply. And I'm going to cut, and I'm going to paste it right in here. Okay? Now, I can't quite do that. I have to do two things. One, I have to <coughs> take this curly brace and put it at the beginning so that the arguments here is inside the curly brace because the whole closure has to have curly braces begin to end. And then, since I need to separate this from the rest, I also put the word in right there. Okay? So that's how you make a closure. It's exactly the same as a function, except for the curly brace starts before the arguments, and you put in after the arguments. Got that? Now, this doesn't look so that I don't need function multiply anymore. So this doesn't look that much better. It's still kind of a mess. But we're going to use type inference, oh yeah, to make this look a lot better. 
Now, remember that Swift knows that this binary operation takes a double, two doubles and returns a double. So this is all redundant. Okay? Swift can infer that that's a double, it can infer that's a double, and it can infer that it <coughs> returns a double. So this is, wow, all of a sudden looking a lot better already. Okay, we can make this look all in one line. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I mean, that alone is probably really, really good. Um, however, we get better than that because closers also can have default arguments. The default argument names are $0, $1, $2, $3, however many arguments it has. So you can put those as the names of the arguments instead of having op1, op2, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, and if you do this, then you don't even need that. Okay, if you use the $0 and $1. And since this is a double, and Swift can infer that this returns a double, you don't need return. <laughs> okay? So we've cleaned up our code quite a bit, and in fact now divide is just this, and add is just this, and subtract is just this. Okay? So that's closures, super powerful. It's used a lot in the iOS API. You're going to be able to use it in your code to your heart's content. Uh, it's very fun. Let's make sure it actually works. All right, seven times eight equals. All right, divided by five equals. Looks good. Minus nine equals. All right, so all of our things here are working. Okay, we also um, could... Uh, so we can do that for our unary operations as well. What if we wanted, for example, something like change sign? Let's go find something to be change sign. How about this? That's not really a change sign symbol, but I'm going to use it for that. I could say change sign is operation dot constant or dot unary operation. Sorry, unary operation, and I need a function that takes a double, returns a double. How about minus dollar zero? Okay, that changes the sign of the one argument. And Swift is smart enough to know that this has one argument and that it is returning that argument and that unary operation is double double so it knows that this must be a double. It'll even infer that. Okay? All right. So that's it for our calculator brain and if we look back at our calculator brain and the code in it, all the code here has nothing to do with UI. It's purely about calculating. And it's super extensible. If you want to add more operations here, all you need to do is to provide the type of operation and what's specific to that operation. All the calculation is done in this very simple function right here. The only complexity of which is this pending binary operation thing we have to do. By the way, this right here, this struct, should also be private. Okay? This struct, which is calculator brain dot pending binary info, that's its full name. That should be private as well, because we're only using that internally. Same thing with this operation. It should be private, because we're not using it in our public API. And same thing with this operation. It should be private. Okay? Should make everything private that you can make private. Okay? Make the things public that you intend to support forever in your object. Okay? All right. So let's do that UI thing I was telling you about. Let's go back to our storyboard here. And we want to make this thing so that when we, let, let's see what it looks like now, actually. Okay, so our UI, we know it doesn't look very good. This is not lined up. This is kind of nice right here, but it's not lined up. But what happens if we rotate to landscape? The way we do that is hardware in the simulator, hardware, rotate left and right. Okay, I'm going to use command keys to do it. Command arrow. Um, that really looks bad because I can't even say equals six times four. Okay, I can't even use this UI. It's so bad. Okay, so we need to fix this UI so that when it's in portrait, it's using the whole space, or laying the buttons out to make it work, and when it's in landscape, it's using the whole space and the buttons are a different shape. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to do that by taking each of these and putting them in a little stack, and then I'm going to take the five stacks and stack them together, and then I'm going to stack this whole thing with this, Okay, and create a stack of stacks, and then I'm going to bind the left, top, right, and bottom edges of that whole thing to the outer edges of my UI. 
That way, when the outer edges of my UI change, that thing will change, and the stacks automatically know how to you know, reallocate the space. Okay, simple as that. So that's what we're going to do. So let's make stacks here. The way we do that, we select the things we want to stack. We go to Editor, Embed in a Stack View. Okay, and that's going to put it in a stack view here. Now, we can also go over to the inspector and inspect some things about this stack view, like I want some spacing, 10 points between each one. Also, you see how the cosine one is wider than the dot? I don't want that. I want them all the same. So I want it to distribute its space equally. Okay, so now they're all equal. Okay, same thing here. Uh, okay, 10 points and fill equally. Now, by the way, there's no command key for this, uh, but you could go to preferences over here, Xcode preferences, and go to the key bindings and give it a command key if you wanted. If you were using stacking a lot, like I am, you could do that. So let's put these in here. 10, fill equally. This one. Oops. 10, fill equally, and this last one. All right, now I have these five stacks right here, okay, horizontal stacks. Now I'm going to take them and put them in a stack, okay? So I'm going to put them in a vertical stack, Bloop. okay? Now these I want uh, here to all be spread out. So right now you see the alignment is leading, so it's putting all these things on the leading edge. I want them to fill instead, so they fill the whole width, okay? I also want spacing here, okay? 10 between all of them, so I've got a kind of a nice little keypad. Now let's stack this with this. So I'm going to select both of these and stack. Okay, put them in a stack together. Again, I want spacing. I want do definitely do not want fill equally here because that would make this blue thing the same height as this big stack. So we don't want that. We just want fill. That means it's going, they're going to be their natural size. Okay. So for this, it's going to be the size that fits this text. And for this, it's going to be a size for all those stacks to fit their contents. All right, now I'm going to finally use the blue lines, okay? Because I'm going to put this thing up in the upper left corner right here, okay? And I'm going to anchor it to that corner. And here's how we do that. We use the control key, just like we did when we were dragging to the code. We can also drag between elements in the UI. So I'm going to drag between this um, stack thing and this outer container. So I'm just dragging up to its top edge. Now when I do, when I control drag between things, I can constrain them to be related in some way. Like I could make them be equal widths. I can make this thing be the same width as the container view. Or I can do what I want, which is constrain the vertical spacing of this to the top layout. In other words, kind of attach that to it. So I'm going to create that. And you can see it creates this little I-beam. It's a little tiny I-beam right there. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing to this edge right here. I'm going to attach the leading space to the container margin. Okay, and I can do the same thing. Now, by the way, when you do this, be careful when you control drag. You want to make sure the thing you're dragging from is the entire uh, stack. Don't be, you know, just control dragging from this eight or it'll actually pin the eight to the edge. Okay, you want to pin this whole stack view, and I'm going to show you how you can select the whole stack view in a second here. So let's drag this over. This is going to be the trailing space. Okay, and now here I'll show you how to, if I click on this thing right here, it's selecting the two, but I want to select the whole thing. So I'm going to do control shift, control shift. Okay, see it down in the lower left there, control shift, control shift, click. When you do that, it says, oh, what thing under the mouse do you want to select? You want to select that outer container, the big stack view, or this little interior stack view. So here I want the big stack view, the one that contains the whole thing. All right, so, and then when I control drag, I'm being careful not to control drag from one of these buttons. And here I'm control dragging from one of the spaces there. Okay, so this is to vertical spacing to the bottom. So now I've tied them to the edges. Unfortunately, I've tied these two edges too far away from the edges, okay? I want to tie these two edges to right up next to it. And the way I do that is I can do it via the inspector right here by clicking on this I-beam. You see, it's constant saying how far it is. I can also double click on this I-beam. And it puts up a little thing here. So I don't want it to be 338 points away. I want it to be either some standard value, or if a standard value doesn't make sense here, which it doesn't, that's why it's grayed out, then I'm going to put it zero points away. Bam. Okay. 
Same thing I can do down here. Let's double click this one. Here, a standard value is available. So I'm going to click standard value. And now it's putting a standard value from the bottom. Okay. Now, when it stretched there, it made these tall. Okay. So that means we did something bad with our um, you know, spacing of the things, which is, what did we do wrong here? Those are all fill equally. Yes, how about this guy right here? Maybe this guy, this guy fill equally. Okay, we want this internal one, okay, this internal stack view to be fill equally. Glad I made that mistake so I show you how to do that, okay? So we've got these all equally spaced out. This looks pretty kind of funny in a square, but I bet it's going to look pretty good in portrait and landscape. Let's go take a look. All right, here's portrait. Hey, that looks pretty darn good. Four <laughs> times eight, you know, plus nine equals square root. Okay, cosine, pi, cosine. Excellent. Let's take a look at landscape. Woohoo! It worked. Okay, so very little work here, and we can make our UI stretchable. Okay, now later in the quarter, we're going to have more sophisticated UIs than just these stack things, but we'll still be using that control dragging to the edges. Now your homework assignment is to reproduce everything I've done in these two days, add that floating point number, add a little text field that shows a history of all the things that have been typed in, and add some more buttons. So you're going to be doing outlets, actions, uh, and, and a little bit more. And that's basically your entire homework, okay? It's all posted. See you next week. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.